Genesis chapter number 6. We'll begin reading in verse number 11. The earth also was corrupt before God, and the earth was filled with violence. And God looked upon the earth, and behold, it was corrupt, for all flesh had corrupted his ways upon the earth. And God said unto Noah, The end of all flesh has come before me, for the earth is filled with violence through men, and behold, I will destroy them with the earth. Make thee an ark of gopher wood, rooms shalt thou make in the ark, and shalt pitch it within and without with pitch. And stop reading there. Now, by way of introduction, I want you all to notice, first, the architect. Did Noah take a plan to God and say, hey, can I build this ark? No. Did Noah, once he received instruction to build it, do we ever find that he changed the instructions that he got? No. Okay, the ark was conceived of, it was designed by, everything was already checked off before Noah got it because God had already done all of the planning. I mean, you could study it out. We can go down, verse number 14, all the way down through the end of the instructions that he got. We find what wood he's supposed to make, or supposed to use, right? Then we find that, you know, not only pitch, but where he's supposed to use the pitch, how he's supposed to use the pitch, how wide it's supposed to be, how tall it's supposed to be, how long it's supposed to be. And as much as, you know, some people may not like to admit it, the ark down there in the middle of the field, a few miles south of here, may be a little bit small, because we don't know how long a cubit was. Okay, but what was a cubit? Well, generally a cubit was the space from here to here. And unless you know how long Noah's arm was from here to here, we don't know how long the ark was. Okay? But we do know it usually was anywhere between 18 to 24 inches. Okay, generally is what people say. I don't know, wasn't there. But God knew how long it needed to be, and God knew how long Noah's arm was. That's why it was so many cubits. Okay, but in the design of it, right, God being one, omniscient, God being two, love. God is not loving, although he does love people. He is love. It's not an attribute of God. God is love. God saw all the wickedness on the world, but yet Noah found grace in the eyes of God. He showed that love towards Noah. But he showed that love in the design of the ark. Look with me, if you will, in verse number 14. Thou shalt make an ark, or make thee an ark of gopher wood. Rooms shalt thou make in the ark. Now, textual critics, because they like to be critical, will tell you that that word rooms means nests. That is in things made out of hay or twigs and everything else that animals stay in. Well, I believe that one, the people that trans... If you go back and study out how they translated... The people that translated your Bible into English, New Hebrew and Greek and Latin and usually a whole bunch of other languages. And they understood the context of it. They were natural speakers of it. They understood how to talk every day. Okay, now, it'd be pretty difficult, let's say, 5,000 years from now, for somebody to come in and translate the word y'all or ain't. Right? Because you need context clues. You got to kind of live in it in order to understand them things. And it'd really throw them off, Brother Bob, if they heard all y'all. That, that just doesn't make sense to somebody that doesn't speak. <laughs> right? Well, it's same thing. Context, the way that they translated it, they said, How did God mean this to be say? What are the very words of God that He wants people to know in English? And they were convicted to write down rooms. Well, what's that mean? That means that there is a delineation between the place where the animals were supposed to be and the place where the people were supposed to be. God didn't say, all right, Noah, build you an ark, and then it's going to rain for 40 days. We're going to break up the waters of the deep. There's going to be some waves while you're in this ark, and oh, by the way, you're just going to be in there tumbling around like a magic eight ball with all them animals. Okay, God put a little bit of forethought into his architectural plans. And he wanted to make one, an ark literally, a vessel or a way of passage to transverse the wrath of God and the punishment of God. But he also, on the inside of that, wanted to make sure that the inhabitants of the ark were taken care of. I mean, what good is a way to survive the storm if you die in the boat? How good is the ark if, you know, an elephant 
Can you imagine an elephant just squeezing up against Brother Kevin on one of the walls of the ark? Right, Brother Kevin's not going to survive that one. And if he did, he's not going to be walking for a while. Get, well, what does that mean? Now, certainly, I don't know how it happened. I don't know how the people who made the ark down there in Dry Ridge, how they figured it out. But I don't know how they housed the animals. I don't know how they fed the animals. But I do know that God put a little bit of forethought in on how to feed Noah and his family because you study it out in chapter number 7. Okay? Trick question. If you ever want to get somebody that thinks that they really know the Bible, ask them, how many animals, how many of each animal went into the ark? They're going to say two. Wrong. Both of them went in by two, but God told them of every clean beast to take six. What was that? Well, what do you think food came from? Right? Well, they eat the clean beast. They didn't eat the unclean beast. What do you think Noah used to make sacrifice unto God? The clean beasts. Some forethought went into these things. God had all the provisions made for them. But I also believe that God gave Noah a little space where, hey, you can get away from all them animals for a little bit. You don't have to share a bed with the donkey. I don't know if the donkey went on. I don't know what animals went on, which animals didn't come on. I don't know which ones were crossbred to get all the ones that we have nowadays. Okay, but I do know God had room for all of them. And he had a designated space for those people that were on the ark. Okay, but second, I want you all to notice, there's a great parallel here from the Old Testament to the New Testament. The ark being a symbol of salvation. Okay, nowadays you might hear it referred to as the old ship of Zion. Right? We're sailing on a boat. Destination, heaven. But along the way, there's going to be some storms. Sure. There's going to be some nights where, like the Apostle Paul, we're in that middle of that Eurachlodon where, you know, they didn't know which way was up or down. They hadn't seen sun, moon, or stars in two weeks. And they're just along for the ride. They've thrown everything that they know to throw off of the boat, and it's still taking on water. Well, there are going to be nights like that in your life, but the ark can't sink. Ship of Zion can't sink. Why? Because when the disciples are on that boat, Master, cares how not that we sink? If Jesus is on the boat, it's not going under. Amen. The verse says that the boat was filled with water. You know what that tells me? They're wondering how this thing hadn't sunk already. And then, try to figure this one out. Boat's full of water, but Jesus was down below sleeping. He wasn't what? So if the boat's full of water and you walk down, you know, to the bottom of the ship, well, Jesus is dry. The rest of us are soaking wet. He's over there sleeping. One of the few times we find him taking a moment to rest his flesh. If God's not worried about it, why are we worried about it? All those are different lessons. We're not teaching on that, though. But see, this old ship of Zion, like the ark, God did take care in designing it. We know that Jesus was the lamb slain before the foundation of the earth. We know that God had the plan already figured out, settled. It was determined, written down, wherever God write things down, to establish it. He knew what was going to happen before he even made the earth before he even said let there be light Amen. so knowing that if God put so much thought into the ark how much more thought did he put into your personal salvation because see the old ship is Zion it's not one of them lines like at Disney where they got all the corrals open and they try to press people in as close as they can and then some people get the fast pass and they get, just get to walk up and stand in a shorter line. Right? I mean, it's not like they just walk on and get on. They still got to get into the line. It's just they bypass a lot of it. Right? Or it's not one of them things where everybody's pinned in together and then at some point they open up the gate and then everybody gets to get off. Right? Not like that. No, the old ship Zion was designed with you in mind. God has a room just for you on the ship of Zion. Amen. There is a place, not just in heaven, because you do have a mansion of your own, but I mean, there's a place where it's just you and God and God's protection called the ark. There's a place where only you can go on the ship 
that you can meet with the master. What do you think Noah did in them rooms? Well, he slept. He rested. I'm certain that he prayed. I'm certain that at some point he offered up sacrifices because Noah found grace in the eyes of God because Noah did right. Do you think that just because he's on the boat Noah stopped doing right? I don't think so. We know when he got off of the boat after he ignorantly drank a wine that had been sitting on the shelf he set it there to celebrate the fact that God was going to bring him through. He didn't know that it turned into fermenting wine. And then after that, he cursed the son for doing the thing that the son did. But he still worshipped, sacrificed unto God. Right? The ark didn't change him. The ark reaffirmed the things that he was already doing beforehand. Right? Do we spend every day on the ark? No. Because Jesus said, go into all the world. But there are times that you need a little bit of rest. There's a storm coming in your life. There may be a flood headed your way. It may be a time where there's going to be a drought where you're at. And even though it doesn't look like it at the beginning, by the end of it, like Joseph, you've got all the food in the world. Even though everybody else is starving. What is that? That's just the Lord's protection in the ark. So with all that light, we're just going to teach on for a little bit. When was the last time you were on the ark? Like I said, God told Noah, make rooms. You think Jesus made an ark without rooms? That old ship is designed to carry us in salvation for the rest of our lives and into all eternity? He's the ship. Amen. He said, if any man be in him, he's a new creature. Well, what does that mean? It means that I now... I'm a partaker of Christ. I'm a joint heir. In the eyes of God, there's no difference between me and Christ. It means I'm literally in Him. I am His and He is mine. Amen. So that being the case, if Jesus is the ark, Jesus got a spot just for you. Amen. Jesus has a spot. He looks at His hands and says, this is what I did for Him. But He knows that's right where I put Him. This is their spot. Nobody else's. One of my favorite verses, Psalm 91, verse 1. He that dwelleth in the secret place of the Most High shall abide under the shadow of the Almighty. What's that mean? You spend time alone with God on the ark, and you're going to be in the shadow of God everywhere you go. You're going to be so close to God, people are going to be able to see God's shadow on you. That's more than just getting up underneath of His wings when you're in trouble. That's saying, I want to be around Him all the time. Because there are things that happen in that room on the ship of Zion that nobody else is going to know. That's where you pour out your soul unto God. Noah's on the ark. He doesn't even know what the world's going to look like when he's done. He doesn't know how long he's going to be on the ark. Find me where God told him it's going to rain for 40 days, 40 nights. Then the waters are going to start subsiding, but it's going to be a big swamp for a while. You're not going to be able to get out. God didn't even tell him how to open the door. God shut it. But nowhere does he say, all right, no, this is how you're going to unwedge the thing that I shut. Because if God shuts it, nobody can open it except God. Noah's just along for the ride. I'm sure at some point, Noah's wife said, no, how long are we going to be on this thing? As long as God wants. How long is that? I don't know. As long as God wants. And there are times that you may believe that, but it's stressful. It's hard to just believe God. That's why it's called faith. It doesn't make sense to the flesh. And your flesh and your soul are contrary to one another. It feels like you're pulling yourself apart. But in the ark, you can say, Lord, I literally feel like I'm about ready to come apart. I feel like I'm about ready to have a mental break. I just need some time on the ark. Well, there's a certainly a place for that. But that room on the ark, it's not just where you bear the, you know, the burdens that you carry in, not just where you, you know, confess your unbelief so that God can help your unbelief. I believe, Lord, but help my unbelief. That's also the place where you get to sup with God. That's where that personal fellowship happens with God. Noah couldn't have fellowship with God if he had not been on the ark. Noah would have been dead. 
You cannot fellowship with God surrounded by and entrenched in the world. If we get away from the things of God, God will not come to us in the world when we've been disobedient in order to fellowship with us. He still told us, Be ye holy, for I am holy. Amen. Now God knows that we're not perfect. That's why the book of 1 John's in there. If we confess our sins, He's faithful and just to forgive us and cleanse us of all unrighteousness. Why? So that we can restore fellowship. Amen. Because He desired to have one-on-one -on -one time with you. Because He desired to sit down and show you those things that you knew not from His Word. He desired that when you're heartbroken and you're laying your head on your pillow but you can't sleep and tears are just rolling out of your eyes, you don't know what to do, He desires to be there through the person of the Holy Spirit and comfort you. Where does all that happen? In your room on the ark. Why? Because that's your place. There's security in your room on the ark. You know the ark's Jesus. And if I'm in his hand, his hand's in the Father's hand, nobody can pluck me out of the Father's hand. Amen. You know that if you're on the ark, if it got to you, it was designed by God. Amen. It was the will of God for that to happen to you. Amen. There's not only security, there's also assurance. Now, if what has just happened to me happened to me, that means... That not only did God want it to happen, or I take that back, not only did God allow it to happen, it also means that God knows it's not going to defeat me. You can't sink the ark. If I'm on the ark, it may feel like I'm taking on water, but I'm not going under. Does not the Bible say that he doesn't let us be tempted above that which we're able? Amen. Doesn't the Bible tell us that no temptation has taken, except that which is common to man? Did Jesus tell Peter that the devil desired to destroy you? No, he said, I desired to have you and sift you. Sifting isn't destroying. In fact, you study it out until you sift the wheat, the wheat's worthless. He said, well, the devil's going to try and destroy you, Peter, but you're going to come out more valuable at the, uh, at the end. That's why he said, but I have prayed for you. On the ark, I can go through the sifter and know I'm going to come out the other side. I may not know the answer. I may not know how long. I may not know for what purpose it may even be. Certainly. I mean, we can... Joseph again. Coat of many colors. Joseph didn't know why he went through all the things that he went through until the end he saw his brethren. He said, you meant it for my harm. God meant it for my good. And then as a result of that, God blessed Joseph's one love for God, his forgiveness of his brethren, and who was his daddy? Jacob, Israel. God used Joseph to preserve God's chosen people. I don't know why, don't know how long. Don't know how God's going to get me out, but there's assurance in the ark, I know I'm going to make it through. Doesn't matter how hard it is. On the ark, you're close enough to God to understand, and you, with your eyes set upon God, you're not going to get your eyes up, start doubting, start wondering. Are there going to be moments where you're tempted to do so? Of course. But it's real hard to start doubting God when you're on the ark. Amen. Real hard to forget about God when you're dwelling in the secret place of the Most High. Where everywhere you go, you can see the shadow or the outline of God in your life. Real hard day. You can still do it. But there's another great thing about the ark. The ark, always. Your ticket's always good. You cannot revoke your own ticket. Now, I've had times... I've jumped off the ark. Guess what? I can still get back on the ark. There have been times 
that I didn't do what God told me to do, but God said, hey, if you call for help, I'll throw out the life raft. You can get back on the ark. Just because I blow it doesn't mean that God takes my room and gives it to somebody else. Just because I may say I'm not happy on the ark doesn't mean that God automatically executes judgment and says, well, if he doesn't want it, I'm going to give it to somebody else. If he doesn't want it, we're going to board up his room to where he can never get back on. No, no, no. That room was for you. And if God intended you to have it in the eyes of God, you've got it for forever. Amen. It's just whether or not you claim it. How many people have a room on the ark, but they've got off? Now, I've said, there may be a time, the, dock, the ark docks, and Jesus says, go under Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, the uttermost parts of the earth. But when you come back, the ark's going to be there. Amen. Your room's still going to be there. But how many people like Jonah have said, I don't want to get on the ark, and they're in the belly of a whale? Yeah. You're going to get where God wants you to get one way or the other. Whether he's got to make you miserable, whether he's got to take all the joy out of your life for you to realize he was the joy of your life, sure. whether you've got to wise up in the hog pen before you can come to yourself, or, as the New Testament tells us, he may deliver some over for the destruction of the flesh so that the soul might be saved. What's that? They completed their journey on the ark. They didn't do it with the ap approval of God on their life. But he said, fine, you don't want to get on the ark, you'll go to heaven. So that you stop vexing your very soul. What does that mean? There's accountability on the ark. Your room came at a price. is the blood of Jesus. Every time you walk into your room on the ark, you're reminded like in the book of Exodus, that there was blood painted on the three posts of the door to your room on the ark. Every time you walk into your room, you're reminded Jesus died on the cross so that I could have this room. The accountability is, one, that was a great price. My life is no longer my own. The other part is, well... I'm on the ark because I realized he could do for me what I couldn't do for myself. Part of accountability is understanding your weaknesses. That's called humility. Lord, I know what you've gifted me with. I also know what you haven't gifted me with. But thankfully in Jesus, we can find the strength of all strength. Arm of flesh is going to fail me. But I'm more than able to do anything through Christ which strengthens me. The accountability of the ark. Every time you walk in, you're reminded, I have a duty. He, say, he gave me this room for a reason. Because that's the beauty of the ark. God knew you needed a home away from home. Amen. We're not in heaven yet. That's home. Sure. But we needed a refuge. We needed a safe place. What's that? That's the ark. Amen. And that room that he gave you, he gave it for you to recharge. He gave it to you to unload the burden because he said cast all your cares upon him because he cares for you. That's the place that you come in and do business with God in private, in secret, so that openly when you come back off of the ark, people realize something happened to him on that ark. Sure. We've been throwing everything that we know to throw at him, but he goes back on that ark every day and he comes back off and he's good as new. Looks like he may have lost a little bit of sleep, but he's still happy as a lark. Looks like he may have been, you know, crying a little bit, but hey, he's still talking about Jesus. Hey, it looks like they've been heartbroken for a while, but they've still got hope. Why? Because my hope is not in me, not in what others can do for me. It's not even in what God promises me. I've already got everything I ever wanted. Amen. Everything else is icing on the cake. Yeah. Yeah. Amen. That's why it's pressed down, shaking, bubbling. I can't even contain what he's already given me let alone what he does for me every day. It still blows my mind that the Bible says daily God renews his promises to us. Amen. Every day God wakes up. Well, God don't wake up. Every day before I wake up, God's already taken every promise that he pinned down in the Bible. And he's promised it just to me again. That blows my mind. Daily he loads us with benefits. 
I've thought on that before. God blesses us so good, loadeth us. He blesses us so good that if he blessed us anymore, we wouldn't be able to walk. Sure. He gives it to us just as much as we can handle because he knows if he blesses us anymore, it'd blow our, we'd like melt into a puddle on the floor. But some people, when they get off the ark, they stop appreciating those things. Before you get off the ark, you're going to nail up your viewport. That little window that you've got in your room, you're going to shut that. Because what did verse number 11 tell us? The earth was corrupt before God and the earth was filled with violence. Before you get off of the ark, you're going to stop caring what life is like off of the ark. Because if I've got the window open, I'm reminded daily, people need Jesus. But if I close that window, I don't have to think about others. It's real easy to be selfish when you don't see the needs of other people. It's real easy to get jaded, to get apathetic, when all you've got to think about is your problems. And I mean, really, I get, get it. We, I mean, we've got problems. But really, do we have problems? I mean, Jesus, told, if we ask anything in the Father in his name, God will bless us with it. It's already promised. I don't even need to pray for it. God's going to meet my needs. But we were instructed in the model prayer to thank him for meeting our needs that day. Because God said, don't even worry about it. Ask, I love you. I'm going to make sure you've got those. The Bible says, having food and raiment, be content therewith. I got a whole lot more than that. So I should be a whole lot more than content. Sure. I should be bouncing off the walls. But see, we close the window. We forget how bad it was before he got us on the ark. And we start looking at our life. We think that we deserve more or we desire more. When really one look out the window would remind us, I've got a whole lot more than I ever had without him. The whole world, corrupt, violent. God said, I don't know, the end of all flesh has come before me. He says, it's so bad out there that I'm planning to get rid of it. Because the stench of it offended God. That God's creation would get that far away from God. And oh, by the way, He gave them a whole lot less time than He's given our generation. It's been over 2,000 years since Jesus came. You study it out from the time that you know Noah got onto the ark. There wasn't that much time between Adam and the ark as we've already had since Jesus came. What does that mean? It means that God's still thankfully patient and long, long suffering. Amen. That His grace hadn't worn out, that His mercy hadn't worn out. Amen. He's given those out there another chance. But we've still got the same promise. God said, I destroyed it with fire once. That's why we got rainbows. He said, no more, no more water. I won't do it next time. I'm going to do it with fire. But see, when you're on the ark and you close the window, it's real easy to forget about the time. If you're in a room with no windows and you've just got the interior of your lighting, it's real easy to lose track of time. It's real easy to forget whether it's day or night. It's real easy to forget how desperate it is out there and how little time that they have. What does that allow us to do? Back off. Just ease up a little bit. But what does the Bible tell us? Man cannot serve God and mammon. He'll love one and hate the other. You cannot have two masters. You're either all in or you're all out. Either it's everything that I can do for God or you're not doing anything for God. In your mind, you might be. But I've said it, as soon as you turn to look at the world, as soon as you turn to see what else you could be doing besides doing what God wants you to do, you've already let go of God. Because in your heart, the decision's already been made. Just like Jesus preached about on adultery, he said, if any man desire to have a woman in his heart, he's already committed the act of adultery. It's the same thing. As soon as you turn to think about the world, you've already let go of God. You've committed spiritual fornication in your heart. Amen. That's why it's very important that when we're on the ark, I mean, I'm thankful that the ark's comfortable, but the ark's not home. Amen. The ark is a temporary thing. 
Why? Because I've got to own, it's got 12 foundations of precious stones. It's got gates made out of huge pearls. But it's got streets that, I mean, they're good streets, but the cheapest thing in heaven is 24 karat gold. That's why the streets are made out of it. I got a mansion that's just for me. One that he said he'd go to prepare. Jesus built my house. I'm good with that. But the ark is not home. Too many people are snoozing on the ark when God says, no, 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 the ark is to help you get from here to there. And along the way, there's still more empty rooms. I firmly believe, this is theology according to Brother Jordan. But I firmly believe that there were empty rooms on that ark. I believe Noah made rooms for family members that didn't get on the ark. I believe that he made rooms for some of his friends that before he started building his ark, they said that they'd be there with him. But once he started preaching, which he'd... But once he started preaching, hey, it's going to rain, they said, no, it's lost it, y'all. He gone crazy. But Noah wasn't an only child. If you study it out, Noah's father died just a few years before... The the rains came. Right, I believe that Noah's dad was a righteous. I believe that Noah didn't know that Noah's dad was going to die. I think he had a room on the ark for his dad. Right, well, here's the great thing. Some people may not get on the boat, when, but when some graduate from off of the boat, God takes their room with them. Well, how do you say that? Because I know that God bottles tears. They're recorded all that time they spent in that room God's already got it in heaven the Bible says that our conversation is already recorded in heaven everything that they did in secret in that room God's got a record of it openly in heaven all the things that they did to further the cause of Christ God's got either precious stones or gold and silver or crowns waiting on them when they get to heaven Amen. just because nobody else sees it doesn't mean that God didn't see it one day everybody will see it because again, it's the ark. It's in Christ. If you do it for the honor and glory of God, what are you doing? You're promoting the Son of God. Why can we pray? Because I've got an advocate with the Father. Why can I pray? Because I've been robed in His righteousness and I've been given a crown as king to rule and reign over this body, but I've also been given a robe as a priest so that I can pray directly to God. I can enter directly into the throne room of God through prayer. Everything that you do in witnessing. What is it? Same thing Peter and John said over there in the book of Acts after they healed that lame man who was walking and leaping, praising God. He said, All we've told you is what we've seen and what we've heard. We're just telling you, Jesus. Yeah. Everything that we do is because He either enabled us to do it or He taught us how to do it and then went and did it with us. Because He's not looking for, as we said, your ability. He's looking for availability. If you say, Lord, what do you want me to do when I get off of the ark? He'll give you something to do. But see, it's not just a one-time visit to the ark. I got to go back daily. That's that secret place. Brother Phil doesn't know how to get to my room on the ark. Brother Phil knows how to get to his room. Nobody else knows what goes on in that secret place in that room. Every now and then, he may send somebody by like he did with Elijah. He may, a ra you know, raven may fly in through the window of my room on the ark and there's a mor morsel of food there because I needed it. Where am I going to get that? Right here. Good. The ark is a companion. Well, what's that mean? Well, the ark is Christ. The Father's the one directing the ark. But see, it's all useless unless I'm willing to listen to the Spirit. You just don't go onto the ark with nothing and expect to come off with something. You've got to be in the Word. Because how do we hear from God? Here. What's preaching? Uh, that's the pronouncement or expository preaching of the Bible. It's what God gave that man to deliver to people. What is it when you do? It's the Word. Well, what do we know about the Word? The Word was made flesh and dwelt among men. 
That's Jesus. You know, this is this is Jesus written out. And not all of it, because John said if everything that he did was written, the whole earth wouldn't be able to contain it. But the Word was made flesh so that we could know the Word, Christ. And we know it because it's spiritually discerned. So if we're in Him, don't you think that we should know about Him? Amen. What He desires? What He would instruct us to do? How He would want us to do it? Because I want to be like Samuel where God said none of his words fell to the ground. That means that none of the arrows that Samuel shot missed the target. They all found exactly what God wanted him to say. That's what I desire. I was so smack dab in the middle of God's will that I couldn't miss him if I wanted to. But you know what? That, that takes work. It takes time on the ark. And see, you can't spend all the time on the ark trying to prepare for off of the ark that God wants you to spend off of the ark. Let me explain. That sounded a little weird. If God wants you to go do something off of the ark, you can't spend that time on the ark. Okay, even in school, they send you home. What? Do homework. Okay, they understand that, yeah, here you learn some things, but you also got to go live. You got to go out into the world. You can't spend all day on the ark and expect God to bless your because there is such a thing as being reluctant to get off of the ark. Some people are so comfortable they don't want to leave the ark. Amen. Well, I'm just trying to make sure that I'm prepared. Well, you're never going to be able to prepare yourself. But if Jesus gives you a sling and a stone and says, go face Goliath, get off the ark. There's no sense in you staying on the ark. You can train with every weapon you want to. God's not going to bless it. Because he gave you a sling and a stone. I can spend the next 50 years if the Lord didn't come back studying about the Word of God. But unless God wanted me to study it, I'm not going to get nothing out of it. What am I going to get? Man's knowledge. And they're ever learning, never able to come to the knowledge of truth. The ark is a great place. It is a haven. It is a stronghold. It is a place where we can reach out. It is a place of fellowship, but it is not where we're supposed to reside. We are in the world, but we're not of the world. You know what that means? We've got to be off of the ark to be in the world. You can't shine a light from inside a boat. You can't be the salt of the earth if you're out on the sea. It is a place where great things happen. It is a place that we should desire. But just like the church, it's a city of refuge. It's a safe place so that we can come in, get what we need to go back out. Because Noah did get off the ark. The ark served its purpose. But when we need the ark, get on the ark. But once you've got what you need, go do what God tells you to do off of the ark. Otherwise, all we're doing is we're just stowaways. People trying to freeload. We're people taking advantage of the grace of God. But all the while, we should be out trying to show the grace and the love and the mercy of God to others. Did you know that IBC is now on iTunes, TuneIn, SoundCloud, and Google Play? Head on over to your podcast provider and subscribe today. And as always, thanks for listening.